30. So this book came out a few years ago. I don't know if anybody heard of it. Um, Emperor of Maladies. So it's a history of um, uh, it's a fairly easy reading. Um, it's not for physicians, it's for my general audience. Um, so if you're interested, it's uh, worth, worth picking up. Um, and uh, chemotherapy, kind of like surgery, there's uh, reports of using drugs you know, hundreds, even thousands of years ago to try to treat things. Not necessarily cancer, but um, you know, you're taking the leaves from aspen trees to create aspirin and different examples like that. Um, modern day chemotherapy really started in uh, the mid 20th century. So anybody know why I'm showing you? This is a picture of a trench during World War One. Sorry? Magnet was that the Magna Lines of Trench? That, I don't know where this trench was. I think I just Googled trench. <laughs> but um, there's a reason I'm showing it related to chemotherapy. So in trench warfare, they used to use gas, right? And uh, mustard gas. And so the first chemotherapies were um, adapt adaptations of mustard gas. So what they found was the mustard gas would cause severe suppression of patients or the soldiers' um, bone marrow. And so some of the early chemotherapies were types of mustard agents that they would inject into people and it would destroy all the bone marrow which could get rid of lymphoma or other types of um, bone marrow cancers, leukemias, things like that. But they made patients extremely sick. All right? and these were started in the 40s and the 50s. Um, again, the Emperor of Maladies does a great job of kind of telling the story of the science behind, the scientists behind this. And people thought they were absolutely insane to be doing this, but um, they showed that they could get rid of cancer, uh, but it caused awful side effects. So when you hear chemotherapy and you think of that, you know, person with complete hair loss and horrible nausea and vomiting, that's from the 1950s and 60s. There's still side effects to chemotherapy, don't get me wrong. Um, we've gotten a lot better both with drugs to control the side effects as well as how we administer these drugs. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, chemotherapy usually treats cancer systemically, meaning it goes everywhere in the body. Um, another use for chemotherapy is it can make cells more sensitive to radiation damage. We'll talk about that in a few minutes. Um, modern chemotherapy, as I was saying, we're better at giving doses. So instead of giving huge whopping doses that cause horrible side effects, we got rid of the cancer. Now we've become much more fine-tuned in how much we give to you know, hopefully still get rid of the cancer or shut it down while not causing awful side effects. We also have much better controlled side effects, better medications to prevent nausea, um, there's actually new techniques to prevent hair loss. Um, I don't know if anybody's heard of this, but there's a cap, a cold cap, that women, mostly women, would wear because it's common for hair. So it's a cold cap that they wear during the chemotherapy infusions, and it's been shown to prevent hair loss. Um, and low blood counts. So um, that's a common side effect. Remember I said the mustard agents, the mustard gas agents, cause severe suppression of bone marrow. Well, bone marrow produces your blood, so red blood cells which carry your oxygen around. So if somebody's anemic, they have low red blood cell count. Uh, and then it also produces your white blood cells and platelets. White blood cells fight infection, and platelets help your blood clot. So if you um, have low red blood cells, you don't have enough oxygen carrying capacity in your blood. If you have low white blood cells, you're very susceptible to infections. And if you have low platelets, you can be susceptible or have uh, bleeding problems. Um, so we're much better at controlling these. We have drugs to boost blood counts back up. We're better at monitoring them and slowing down or stopping the chemotherapy if blood counts are dropping. Uh, and then there's something called targeted agents. This is a whole new class of drugs. Um, you know, the traditional chemotherapy, the concept was we're going to give you something that's really toxic to you and hopefully even more toxic to the cancer. All right, so those mustard agents are a great example of that. Um, there's new types of drugs which we call targeted agents, which target the cancer. So rather than targeting you and the cancer, they really try to just target the cancer. Um, one example is immunotherapy. Has anybody heard of this? Um, so immunotherapy is uh, the idea of using a drug to turn your own immune system, which usually is used to fight infection. <coughs> Although we know from research that the immune system is also looking around your body at all times for cancer. So your immune system catches cancers and shuts them down or kills them often. And as, um, as people either get older, their immune system may get a little bit less um, adept at doing this. Uh, or cancers just develop to have ways of tricking the immune system into ignoring them. We can now give drugs that kind of turn the immune system back on against the cancer. 
And this is, I've seen this develop just in the last 10 years since I got into the field of oncology. And it's been pretty remarkable some of the responses we've seen. And uh, particular um, tumors like melanoma, which is a type of skin cancer, used to be almost completely non, wouldn't respond to normal types, traditional types of chemotherapy. Now with immune therapy, we can often shut it back down completely. It's been pretty remarkable. Um, and again, this is attacking the cancer cells. Now there can be side effects because occasionally the immune system will go haywire and attack your normal tissue. So we're seeing new types of side effects, but in general people will do very well with these side effect wise. Then there's another class we call biologics. These are drugs that target signaling or, uh, or proteins in the cancer cells. So cancer cells to grow out of control, which is what cancer is doing, often have mutations. And what a mutation does is it causes a protein to do something abnormal. So a protein may either turn off the brakes on cell division and cell growth, or it may turn on a signal that tells the cell to grow or to invade out of where it's supposed to be. Um, if we can identify one of those proteins in the cancer cells, then we can give a drug that blocks just that problem protein, which in the rest of your body is doing what it's supposed to do. And so if we block it in the cancer, we can preferentially kill the cancer cells or shut them down without causing severe side effects to the patient. Does that make sense? Um, this picture here is probably, have you ever seen a picture like this? So this is uh, what we call a signaling cascade. So this would be, um, this is what a molecular biologist, a molecular cell biologist would look at. Um, this is supposed to be the nucleus of the cell where the DNA is. This is the surface of the cell. These are proteins on the surface of the cell. And then these are all different proteins that the cell uses to signal from the surface down to the nucleus to tell it to undergo division, um, migration, create angiogenesis means create blood vessels. So there's all these um, signaling pathways to turn those on or off. And cancer cells often, those signaling pathways have gone haywire and they're running out of control. Um, and so these are examples of different drugs that we can give that block specific um, proteins in the cell. Uh, there's a common, probably one of the first or the earliest drugs that we use for this, something called Perceptin. Has anybody heard of Perceptin? Uh, it's a drug that we use in women with a particular kind of breast cancer that has this HER2 protein and it's overexpressed, meaning there's too much of it and it's turned on and it's making the cells grow. So we give Herceptin that blocks that and we can shut the cancer cells down. So it's, and it has fairly minimal side effects around the rest of the body. All right, so as opposed to traditional chemotherapies that kind of damaged everything, you know, it was like a, what is it, scorched earth um, philosophy, and you just hope you kill the cancer cells and don't kill the patient. With these types of drugs now, we can really, we're starting to target the cancer much more focused, uh, in a much more focused way than just using the uh, traditional chemotherapy. Uh, now that doesn't mean we're not using traditional chemotherapy. Uh, some some cancers we, we've given we've stopped that and we just use these targeted agents. But often we combine them. We can combine a targeted agent with traditional therapy and improve the chance of getting rid of it even even more. So um, there's another type of drug called hormonal therapy, and this pretty much focuses on uh, prostate cancer and breast cancer. Um, prostate cancer is a male-only cancer, and it usually feeds off of testosterone, which is a male hormone. Uh, this used to be my boyhood idol. Do you know who that is? It's Mark McGuire. He played for the Oakland A's when they won their last title. Was he the court guy? No, he was the steroid guy. Oh. <laughs> so, he went from being a pretty pencil-thin guy when I remember him in the late 80s to this huge guy, Jose Canseco and Barry Bonds, they were all using steroids. Those are types of testosterone. What we do is we do the reverse. We take away testosterone with drugs and we can shut down prostate cancer. Um, now men don't like it because it has side effects. It can cause hot flashes. So women who've gone through menopause, a lot of times the wife will go, oh, finally, you know what I've been experiencing. <laughs> uh, but it can cause hot flashes, it can cause some mild waking, it causes some mild what muscle loss. Um, but it's an amazing treatment because it can completely shut down the cancer for years. I've seen men on this for even over 10, 15 years. And, um, oftentimes it will start to grow without testosterone, but there are some men where they can be on it literally 10 or 15 years and, and the cancer is just shut down. Similarly, in breast cancer, um, 
many breast cancers arise that are responding to estrogen and progesterone, which are female hormones. Uh, and we can give drugs that block estrogen or progesterone and shut down breast cancer. Um, and so those are actually kind of, in a, in a sense, targeted agents that we've been using now for 40 or 50 years. Any questions so far? No? Is this kind of the right level? Am I too, too high, too low? No? Okay. Uh, I do have a question sure. regarding the uh, screen that you just spoke about. Do you have to stay on that therapy, or once the cancer disappears, you can get off of that? Um, so it depends why you're on it. If you're on it because you had cancer just in the prostate or just in the breast, and it was a um, hormone receptor, it, it, and it had these hormone receptors, we often will recommend a course of hormones. In women, it's often five to 10 years of hormone treatment with the goal of curing them, then we stop it. Because at a certain point we say, if it's gone, it's gone, so we're going to stop. And in men, we might do somewhere between six months to two years of the hormone suppression, and then stop it. Um, and then we, we say, you're cured until we know otherwise, and we watch and make sure nothing comes back. Um, the other example would be a woman who has breast cancer, maybe they had surgery five years ago, and now it came back in her bones and in her liver, and it's got hormone receptors we can give them those drugs and they would stay on them indefinitely unless the cancer starts to grow again. Um, and just like the men I was mentioning, there are women who can be on those hormone blockers for years, some many times before they would need to switch drugs. Similarly, in men who have prostate cancer, if the prostate cancer spreads and it's in their bones or their lymph nodes, we're not trying to cure them, we may put them on hormone suppression indefinitely until it starts to figure out how to grow without the hormones. Does that make sense? So if, if, if we're trying to cure you at a certain point, we usually stop it and say, you got to kind of sink or swim, so we're going to see if it's gone completely. Uh, whereas if it's more, if it's spread and we can't cure you, we may use it to shut it down indefinitely, rather than using traditional chemotherapy drugs, which are more toxic and probably less effective in a lot of cases. Uh, is this uh, injections, pills, liquids? How is this? Um, Depends. Uh, in, the, in women, it's often an injection. Uh, in younger women, where they are still in um, having their uh, menstrual periods, we may use injections to further shut down their hormones. Um, and some women actually will even have, if they're done having children, we may have them have a um, have their ovaries removed. Uh, and then in men, it's almost usually a, a um, injection. Sometimes we add a pill. Um, and then in rare cases, it used to be the standard treatment 40 years ago before we had these types of drugs, they would have a cat, they'd be castrated. Um, but nowadays we have drugs that have the same effect and you don't need to have surgery. So, And you can reverse that. You can't reverse a surgery, surgery like that. So, um, I should just, the injections in men are often once every three or six months. So it's not like a, uh, you know, not going in or getting an injection every day. Um, in the women who have breast cancer, it's often a pill that they just take every day for five or ten years. All right, so we talked about surgery and chemotherapy or drug therapy. Now let's talk about the third um, type of treatment. So this is radiation or radiotherapy. And like I said earlier, I kind of think of it as closing the gap between chemotherapy and surgery. So let's take a hypothetical example of a brain tumor. Um, you have the tumor here, these little points coming off would be like microscopic cancer growing around and then you have spots maybe elsewhere in the brain that is spread around the brain. So if we do surgery, the surgeon would go in and cut out what they can see, but like we said earlier, they can't just keep cutting out, you know, if they, if they were to cut this whole area out, you know, there goes the patient's memory of kindergarten or they can't use their right arm or, you know, obviously you can't just keep cutting away a brain. Um, and it didn't do anything for these microscopic spots. So um, for many brain tumors, the patient would have surgery first, take what we can see, get a diagnosis. Um, but then we make a chemotherapy, and that goes everywhere. Right? So it's going to bathe the entire brain in chemotherapy. So that'll get rid of these um, small dots here, and also maybe shrink down some of these bigger areas that are around where the surgery was. But we still have some area left. So we can do radiation. Radiation will be targeted, so it's not going to treat the entire brain, but we can make a bigger bath of radiation than the surgery. So 
Um, the way I describe radiation is I can create a bath of any size and shape inside a patient's body um, and treat that area. With the chemotherapy, when that's given in a case like this, does that go through the whole body? It does. So, um, okay. so in brain tumors, it's a good question. In brain tumors, it's actually extremely rare that it would spread to another part of the body. It almost always will just stay in the brain. But when you take that drug, it goes everywhere through the body. And so it can, even though we're, tra we're trying to hit the brain, it actually, one of the main side effects would be nausea, because it's going to hit the stomach and intestines, and also uh, can cause platelet counts to go down. Platelets are part of your blood that help your blood clot if you get cut. Um, okay, is that the case even if the cancer started somewhere else, like in the lungs, it ended up in the brain? Same scenario? Um, so, the types of drugs we use for tumors that start in the brain are uh, special drugs that get into the brain because a lot of traditional chemotherapy doesn't do a good job of getting into the brain. So oftentimes if you have a cancer that starts in the lung or the breast or somewhere and goes to the brain, we'll use radiation to treat the brain and then we use a drug that goes everywhere else in the body to treat other parts. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. Thank you. With Yes. So with this, uh, with the uh, chemotherapy and the radiation, uh, as people get older, with the bone marrow, the effects of these treatments on bone marrow, could that be critical depending on age? Or? Yeah. So as, as folks get older, their uh, ability to to tolerate and any sort of insult to their body starts to go down, and so. Um, they're going to be more sensitive to damage to the bone marrow and other things like that. So sometimes a medical oncologist that does chemotherapy might say, you know, man, you're 95. I don't think we can give you chemotherapy safely. Um, I actually often will treat patients with just radiation. Who normally would get chemotherapy and radiation because I can really target where I'm treating as opposed to going through the whole body. I, I sometimes can treat elderly patients who wouldn't be able to receive chemotherapy. Um, you know, and again, that's where we've gotten better also. The medical oncologists know what they can give. We're better at watching it and, and, and dosing the drug so that it's safe. Um, so by combining all three of these, hopefully we've gotten rid of the tumor, right? We use the surgery to get rid of the big tumor. We use the chemotherapy to get rid of the little spots around the brain. We use the radiation to mop up right around the surgery. And we would call this trimodality therapy, or tri kind of triple combination therapy. So I'll give you a little background on radiation. So radiation is made up of photons, or little packets of energy. Um, the light that's lighting this room up is photons. These are just low energy photons. And you know when you go out in the sun, if you get sunburned, that's because the visible light that you can see is mixed in with higher energy ultraviolet light. And the ultraviolet light can get into your skin and damage the DNA on the su surface of your skin. That's what causes a sunburn. Um, the x-rays, the, the radiation I use in my clinic is just much higher energy and it can go all the way through the entire body and damage the DNA or the brain of any cells that it hits. So if we can get enough of it at the cancer and not too much at the normal tissue, we can kill the cancer and not cause too much damage. Um, so as I was saying, radiation that we use to treat cancer just has more energy stored in each photon than the light that's lighting the room up right now. So when you, you treat with the radiation, you say, and it causes damage. Is that damage repairable, or is yes, it, or not repairable? Yes, because I mean, you're over there treating with radiation, and so it's worse. It's burning, or so. So what happens actually in the cells? So in each, each individual cell, the radiation causes little damage, pieces of damage to the DNA or the brain of the cancer cells. Um, the cells are trying to repair that, and they have lots of ways of doing that, right? Remember I said, when you go out in the sun, your cells are being damaged all the time. Your, your body has developed ways to repair da damage to the DNA. If we overwhelm, if we cause too much damage and the body can't repair it, then the cells die. Mm -hmm. So if I give enough radiation to a part of your body, it's going to kill all the cells there, whether it's normal cells or cancer cells. Now, cancer cells are, uh, I should say, normal cells are better at healing than cancer cells. And the, the uh, analogy I like to use when I'm talking to my patients is I say it's, uh, like a car driving without brakes. So cancer cells have lost their brakes. And we hit them with radiation, we shred their tires, and they keep driving on the rims and crash and burn. 
when your normal tissue gets hit with, hit with radiation, it senses the damage, pulls over to the side of the road, fixes the tire, it gets on the road and keeps driving. Uh, and I think I'll talk about this in a minute, but that, that's why radiation is every day, Monday through Friday, for a few weeks, not one day we're giving one big walking treatment. We do do that in special cases, um, but traditional radiation for breast cancer, prostate cancer, is once a day, Monday through Friday, for several weeks. And that's because in between each treatment, your normal tissue has a chance to repair itself. Um, so this is the electromagnetic spectrum. Um, Remember I was saying visible light is no different than x-rays, it just has lower energy. So you go all the way from radio waves, microwaves, visible light, ultraviolet, then we get into x-rays and gamma rays, which is what we use to treat cancer. Um, so radiation is kind of interesting. Remember I said surgery and chemotherapy, we have things from the Egyptians showing they tried surgery. People have been using different forms of drugs for millennia. Radiation, nobody knew it existed until 1895. And then a scientist in um, Austria discovered x-rays. Um, he was in his basement, he had some sort of lab set up there, and um, noticed that he turned on a special tube and something was blowing across the room. He said there must be these rays that are transferring the energy, he called them x-rays. He won the Nobel Prize about six years later. Now, it's a little scary because that's 1895. In 1896, the first patients to be treated with radiation for cancer was actually thought to be in Chicago. So within a year, somebody tried this. So this is before we had uh, institutional review boards that make sure people aren't doing crazy experiments on patients. Uh, but someone, within a year, they're already trying to treat cancer with this and lots of other things. So how many people remember maybe going to the shoe store and having your feet x-rayed? Um, they used to treat acne with radiation. Uh, just a kind of side story, a uh, history, uh, high school history teacher, he had um, called them FFT came and T's, fun facts to know and tell. This is kind of a little radiation. So in 1901, Thomas Edison was displaying an early form of the X-ray machine at the World's Fair, and President McKinley was shot on the other side of the fair. And there's speculation that had they used the X-ray machine and able, been able to find the bullet and maybe save him, but I think they were scared to put a president into an X-ray machine in order to do it. Ended up dying. So, but. Um, for the first 50 years or so, from like 1900 to 1950, um, we mostly were using low energy x-rays or using things like radium, which was a natural um, form of getting radiation uh, to treat cancer. In the 1950s, two things changed. Number one is we developed something called the linear accelerator, which is what most radiation clinics use now around the world. Uh, it's kind of like the old two TVs. Um, does anybody know how those used to work? You know, before we had flat screens? The big, thick, I'm sure everybody really remember. When I talk to medical students, they look at me with blank faces. They don't know what they are. But I remember them. But, um, so it was a little electron gun in the back, and it would accelerate electrons up to the screen. When they hit the screen, they made it light up. All right, if we go back, where's that? Here we go. So this is what we do in our clinic every day. This is the old TV. You had an electron gun, and the electron would accelerate and hit the screen, and then it would fluoresce and it needs to be light. In our clinic, we have an electron gun, it gets accelerated to a much higher energy, and then it gets pointed down to the patient and it's tungsten titanium, and the tungsten causes x-rays to spray out. You can't see them with your eyes, but it's actually, in some ways, similar technology to what we used to use in the old tube TVs. Um, another thing that changed was uh, we developed new types of natural, well, I shouldn't call it natural, new types of radioisotopes, meaning um, uh, compounds that emitted radiation. And that was because of the nuclear era. So with nuclear fission and um, nuclear power, we started to get things like something called cobalt-60, um, iridium, there's a whole slew of different radioactive um, compounds that we can now use to treat patients that we have because of the nuclear um, experiments done in the 1940s for the atomic bomb. Um, so there's different ways we can deliver radiation. Again, linear accelerator, is what's used in most clinics. Um, there's something called the cyber knife you might hear about on the radio. Uh, it's actually just a form of linear accelerator. Um, gamma knife uses little cobalt sources to target things in the brain. And then brachytherapy, where we put radiation inside using seeds or other ways of depositing radiation into a patient. Using what? Seeds. Seed. That's so, what I thought you said. Yeah, little, little radioactive seeds. So it's commonly used for prostate cancer. 
Um, but we can also use it for breast cancer. It's been used for other types of tumors as well. Do they swallow it, or do you insert it? Prostate cancer, we insert it with needles. Mm -hmm. um, there's also liquid radiation that's used sometimes for thyroid cancer that the patient just swallows. So it's radioactive iodine, and then it gets absorbed, and the iodine concentrates in the thyroid gland. Um, Barbara Bush had a thyroid problem. I don't, know, I don't know if it was cancer or something else, but um, so she had to use that, and I remember she hearing the story that she said the worst part of it was she couldn't have her grandkids for three months because her thyroid was radioactive and they said don't go near your grandkids. Um, so before we do radiation we uh, map out where we're going to treat. So if you think back to that brain tumor example, um, this would be the tumor. We got a scan that shows where it is. We can map out areas around it that are at risk for having microscopic cancer. And then we line beams of radiation up from all around the patient to hit what we want to hit and miss what we want to miss. Um, yeah, kind of. Uh, it's um. So this uh, this picture is a topographic map. Um, has anybody seen a topographic map before? It shows you elevations on a mountain. Um, so this is Mount St. Helens, which erupted I think in 1980, and this is a topographic map. So each of these lines tells you what elevation you're at. So 1250, 1500, 1750. If you're inside the line, you're higher. If you're outside the line, you're lower. Um, we use the same thing in the radiation clinic. We have lines that our computer shows us how much radiation is going to different parts of the body. And I know if I'm inside this blue line, I'm above 20% of the dose. And if I'm outside, I'm below 20%. So this red line is what we want to hit with 100%. And it's going right around where this tumor is that we're targeting. So <coughs> you can see they use beams coming in from around the patient. Each beam is giving a low dose of radiation, but right around the tumor, it's a very high dose of radiation. So you're able to see, okay, if that's a brain tumor, and you're doing the radiation, you're able to see where that beam is hitting? So we, we plan it out on a scan before the patient comes to our clinic. Uh, and so this is an example where we have a scan, and we, in our computer system, line the beams up from all different angles. Oh, I see, the machine, or the, yeah. Yeah, when the patient comes in, they're put on the table and they're in a mask or a mold that keeps them in the same position every day. And we take x-rays to make sure they're in exactly the right position. And then we turn the machine on and it's at each of the angles that the computer figured out for us. Um, so we, well, we can use this then to know how much radiation is going to the tumor. But we can also use it to know how much radiation is going to the eyes or the rest of the brain. And based on 100 years of experience, we know how much radiation your eyes, the nerves to your eyes, your brain stem, uh, your bowel, your bladder, things like that can take safely. And when we plan the radiation, we keep the dose of radiation below the safe threshold. Doesn't that vary from person to person? It does, um, but not enough that, I mean, in general, for example, your spinal cord, which if we damage that would paralyze somebody, can take about 50 units of radiation. There are probably some people you can get 55, and maybe some people you can get 51. So we set the safe cutoff at 50, which means the chance of having damage is less than you know, one in a thousand. Um, is that monitored so that it might change from treatment to treatment? Or, I mean, the, the progress? Or it's just decided at the beginning, and then that's what's continually given? Oh, good question. So, um, <laughs> Oftentimes we just do it all the way through because nothing changes. Um, but in certain types of cancer, there may be change. I think the most common one I deal with is throat cancer. So when we're treating a throat cancer, the patient's throat gets very sore and after about two or three weeks, and then seven weeks of treatment. So if their throat gets really sore, they can stop eating or at least eat a lot less and they start losing weight and they may get thinner. Well, my computer planned out the radiation expecting their neck was 16 inches around. And so it's pushing enough radiation in to get to the tumor for 16 inch neck. But if now it's a 15 inch neck, everything is going to get more radiation on the inside because it's, there's less tissue. So we can take them, say, three weeks into treatment, rescan them, replan everything, and kind of keep going forward with a new plan that's adapted. Also, sometimes the tumor will shrink. And so I've had lung cancers and throat cancers that shrink so after three weeks they've gotten so small we redo the planning so we're staying farther away from normal tissues. Um, so 
let's see. Uh, also, just one other thing is there are some other types of radiation. Uh, the one you may have heard of on the radio is proton therapy. Uh, there's a center in Warrenville. Um, this has the same effect on killing cancer cells. The difference is it gives less radiation to surrounding normal tissue. So in special cases, children with tumors, people who have cancers next to an area that already got radiation, protons can allow them to be treated where I can't treat them with x-rays. Um, I kind of already touched on this, why are there side effects? I said, you know, the normal tissue is better at healing than the tumor, uh, but there's still damage. And so the art of what I do is balancing the chance of controlling the tumor with the chance of causing side effects in the patient. Um, you know, we're willing to accept some mild side effects if that means we can get rid of the tumor, right? I could treat, I could treat somebody with a very low dose that causes no side effects, but it's not going to get rid of the tumor. I could treat somebody with a really high dose that's going to absolutely get rid of the tumor, but it might make, you know, if it was a prostate cancer, it might make the rear end fall off. Um, and so you have to kind of work in between. So we have enough radiation that it, most of the time, will get rid of the cancer, but shouldn't cause severe damage to the patient. Um, and so this is where there's a lot of active research, and my, my specialty is how can we adjust the radiation, how can we target it better, how can we change how we deliver it to optimize the cancer killing and, and reduce the um, side effects to the patient. So here's the example I was saying. So this, this graph is uh, the dose of radiation, so low dose up to a high dose, and the chance of response or toxicity. So this is the tumor. So as we go up, this is the 100% cure, this would be 0%, and this is damage to normal tissue. So no toxicity, really high toxicity or damage. So if I give a low dose of radiation, I don't cause any damage, but my chance of curing the cancer is only 20%. If I give a medium dose of radiation, I have a little bit of damage, but my chance of curing the cancer is maybe 80-90%. If I give a really high whopping dose, I kill the cancer, but my normal tissue damage is really high. So, you know, we're always kind of striving for that blue line, and it does vary patient to patient. It can change depending on where the tumor is. Um, and so that's, again, kind of the art of what I do. In the past 20 years, we've developed even kind of newer types of treatment where we use computers to plan out the radiation, we use x-rays and CT scans to target it better. Um, you know, an example of that would be, remember, we go back to this brain tumor we were talking about earlier. Old-fashioned radiation was a beam from the right, a beam from the left, and everything in between got hit. So you hit the tumor, but you hit a whole bunch of normal brain, too. All right, then in, like, the 1980s and 90s, we started to do what we call three-dimensional conformal radiation. We use multiple beams and hit around the tumor. Well, now, now we've started to do something we are called intensity modulated. We can make this shape of radiation fit right around the tumor. Well, what if the patient moves a little bit? They come in for treatment on day one, they're in the right position. On day two, they, they're a half inch to the left. Well, if I treat them, I'm going to miss it, right? So I can use images. I think it'll show up. There we go. So this is an example of an x-ray where we have Half of this is the x-ray from the day they had their planning scan to get ready for radiation, and half of it is on the treatment table. And we can line it up so we get them shifted back into the right position and we hit the tumor. So it allows us to give a really tight, carefully shaped dose of radiation and be confident that we're killing the tumor. Uh, I mentioned proton therapy. Uh, when the patient walks into the room, there's about, I think, 15 of these centers around the country now, maybe 20. Uh, when they walk into the room, they see something like this. What they don't realize is outside of that room, it looks like this. It's a three-story tall structure. These are, uh, for one of these, it's about $20 million. But most of them have four of these structures. So you're talking about 100, or even after all the construction and everything, a couple hundred million dollar facility. So it's extremely expensive. Um, the cost of treating is more expensive. And so this gets into an interesting health economics debate. You know, if, if they haven't proven it's better, should we be using it? Um, I, I won't get into it beyond that, other than to say it's, it, in my opinion, it, there's a, definitely a role for it, but it's, not everyone is going to benefit from proton therapy. And what exactly is proton therapy? So it's, uh, instead of using x-rays, we use protons, which are um, uh, essentially helium atoms, and they can, uh, sorry, uh, hydrogen atoms, but they can, 
accelerate them up to high speeds and shoot them into patients. So the way I describe it is x-rays, if I point an x-ray beam at you, it goes in one side and comes out the other. So we use beams from all around to hit the tumor. Um, with protons, it's like saying if you had a bullet and you wanted to shoot it at the wall and you could tell it to stop exactly 6 inches or 8 inches or 12 inches in the wall. So it's not going so, all the way through? Correct. It goes in and it stops. Okay. So they can reduce the amount of normal tissue that gets hit with low dose radiation. So children who might live another 50 or 60 years after treatment, they're at a high risk for cancer caused by radiation, which is kind of our worst side effect. Um, and so if we can minimize that extra radiation, that's really beneficial. But in a 75-year-old man with prostate cancer, they've never shown protons to be any better than what we do, they're, but they're a lot more expensive. Um, like I said, in my clinic, I send people to the proton center who I think need it. Um, but uh, it's not going to be beneficial for everybody. All right, we'll go over a few cases and then um, we'll have time for questions. So, um, case one, this is a patient with breast cancer. This is uh, the most common type of cancer in women in the United States. Uh, this lady present, uh, came in with a lump in her left breast. She didn't have any lumps in her armpit. So um, we actually combined uh, treatment for her. She, had, she would have surgery, uh, often a lumpectomy, where they take just the tumor out of the breast. Um, then she would have chemotherapy, but just with hormone treatment, assuming they don't find any lymph nodes. Um, and then she would have radiation to the breast if she had just that lumpectomy because we know there's a risk of cancer cells left around where the tumor was. If she had a mastectomy, which is what they used to do in all women with breast cancer up until about 40 years ago, um, she wouldn't get radiation because the, the surgeon took everything off and the risk of any cancer cells left behind is, is quite low. But you can see, you know, even in this woman with um, an early type of breast cancer, we would combine all three of these, surgery for the lung, hormone therapy to suppress any cancer cells left behind, and then radiation also for any cancer cells in the remaining breast. Um, now what if she came in with lumps in her armpit, meaning lymph nodes, so the cancer is in the breast and it's spread in her armpit. So then she would get surgery, possibly a mastectomy or possibly just the lump taken out. She would get cytotoxic, meaning kind of the traditional chemotherapy, because the risk of it spreading to other parts of her body is higher. She'd also get hormonal therapy if it had the hormone receptors, and she'd even get that Herceptin treatment I told you about, the targeted agent, the biologic therapy. And then we would treat her with radiation to both the breast or where the, if she had a mastectomy where the breast used to be, and to all the lymph node areas along her collarbone and kind of behind her breastbone. Um, so again, using all three of these, surgery to take out what we can see, chemotherapy to kind of try to get rid of anything else around her body, and radiation in between to kind of get rid of stuff left in her armpit or on her chest. Any questions about those? No. Um, prostate cancer, this is the most common cancer in men. A uh, 63-year-old gentleman with a high PSA, this is a blood marker for prostate cancer. Um, and he has different options. He could have surgery by itself, and that might cure him. Um, well, assuming they biopsy the prostate, find out it's cancer, I should say. He may have surgery by itself, that would be okay. Um, he may have radiation by itself. Radiation either internally with those seeds I mentioned, or using external x-rays or protons. Um, depending on what they find after either of those, he also get a hormone treatment or chemotherapy. And then if it came back elsewhere in his body, then he may have chemotherapy. Uh, colon cancer. So this is another very common type of cancer in men and women. Um, and uh, so in a 60, yeah, so in men, in men and women, it's the third most common cancer. So in men, the most common is prostate, then lung, and then colon, and in women, it's breast, uh, lung, and colon. Um, so 61-year-old woman, she had blood in her stools for a few months, she had colonoscopy and found cancer. Um, they would often do surgery to take it out. If it's in the main part of the colon, which means uh, from here around to about here, if that part of the colon flops around inside. So I can't do radiation, I can't target it reliably, so I, I'm not going to treat somebody's entire belly. So then she would just have chemotherapy after, potentially traditional chemotherapy, maybe with a biologic type of drug. If it's in her rectum, which is the end of the colon down here, uh, that's much harder to operate on and there's a higher risk of leaving cells behind. It's also easier for me to target because things don't move down there. 
So oftentimes there we'll do radiation chemotherapy first to help the surgeon and shrink down the tumor, then the surgeon can take it out. Um, the new area we're looking at in colon and rectal cancer is doing chemotherapy and radiation and just watching. And in a, a good proportion of patients, we can sometimes completely avoid surgery. Could, could you repeat that, please? So a new, a new area we're looking, we've been looking at in the last five or ten years is um, doing chemotherapy and radiation for rectal cancer, which is colon cancer, which is kind of at the, the very end of the colon in mm -hmm. the pelvis. And uh, in select patients, we can watch it and it'll disappear without ever having surgery. Um, that's not standard. There's studies going on to look at this, but there's a lot of patients who have been able to avoid surgery. And we think eventually we'll have to be able to identify patients that could just have chemotherapy and radiation and potentially avoid surgery altogether. Kind of keep surgery in your back pocket if needed. Uh, last case, I believe is, um, I have two more. Uh, throat cancer, so here's a 43-year-old man with a lump in his right neck and pain with swallowing, and they find a tumor in his tonsil. Um, this is becoming more common because of the HPV virus. Um, and HPV, we knew caused cervical cancer and other anal cancer, um, but it's actually causing a lot of throat cancer now. We used to see more throat cancer related to smoking and drinking alcohol, uh, but in the last 20 years we've seen a switch now almost throat cancers from the HPV virus. People are smoking and drinking less, uh, the virus is causing cancer. Um, surgery in these types of cancers can cause severe side effects. We go in and cut out the back of somebody's throat, they may have trouble swallowing or speaking. So in these patients, we can treat them just with chemotherapy and radiation. Uh, we call this organ preservation. So we're saving their, their uh, uh, throat. And with a combination of chemotherapy and radiation, we can cure a high percentage of these patients without ever needing surgery. Um, and then lastly is uh, lung cancer. Uh, this is the, unfortunately the most common cause of cancer death in men and women, second most common cancer. Although we're seeing it decline as people are smoking less and less. So a 73 year old man who's been smoking presents with a cough and they find a tumor in his lung. Um, and I put up here, there's a whole slew of different options. If it's a small tumor that he may just have surgery, nowadays we can do a form of focused radiation uh, where we give three or, or five treatments, um, and it's equivalent to surgery. So a lot of patients who've been smoking for the last 50 years are not able to go into a surgery and have part of the lung taken out. And up until about 20 years ago, we told them we didn't really have a good treatment for them. Uh, now we can do this focused form of radiation. Um, they don't really, often don't notice any side effects, and we can completely obliterate the tumor with pretty minimal side effects around it. Um, more advanced cancer though, they may have a combination of chemotherapy, radiation, surgery, um, immunotherapy is being used very commonly for this now, the biologic therapies, they may do radiation before or after surgery, so I, I kind of put this up to show you when, when I get together with my doctor friends and talk about patients with tumor boards, well, this is what we're trying to hash out, what's the best way to take care of this patient using all three of these approaches. And usually they're uh, friendly, um, friendly environments and we're all working together to try to get the best treatment for the patient and um, we all kind of different viewpoints. So um, in summary, uh, utilizing the advantages of each treatment, chemotherapy, surgery, and radiation are combined to treat cancer. Um, different types of treatment have advantages and disadvantages and each patient's treatment is based on their unique clinical situation. Um, so I'm happy to take any questions or discuss anything if you have something else you want to ask about. Thank you. Yeah. I wanted to ask, uh, I'm, I have tumors on my liver and they're treating me with chemo. Yeah, it take? Maybe six or seven. Yeah, you have yeah, probably even longer. Um, so, uh, Actually, no, I gave a talk to the residents, so eight or nine. Yeah, Gina so that was even for me. Yeah, she's not, Gina wasn't talking to him. Yeah, so he's been coming for some time. Uh, he's been helping me with programs here for at least five or six years. I keep having him come back because he's really good, and this is probably what your third time doing this particular talk. Second or third, yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely at least the third, because I had it twice in Mokina. Um, and I have him keep doing this talk because it, I find that it's really good. I want to support for I find a lot of patients have questions about sort of comparing themselves to the other patients. Why did they give me this many cycles of chemo and that person only six, or, or so on and so forth. So it's a pretty general talk of sort of how they come to treatment decisions and what their goals are. So. Um, 
I will be in the building. I just need to, I've seen this presentation several times and I'm way behind on a lot of work, so I'm just going to step into my office and get a few things done. I'll come back in about the uh, 15 to 10 minute warning there for you, Dr. Golden. Sure. Anything else for me that you need? I don't think so. I just, oh, sorry. Technical stuff? Oh, no, no, I'm just making sure I remember what the. Uh... Oh, okay. okay. So I'll turn over to the last thing. If anyone uh, is not familiar with our building, if you need to use the bathroom, go out this door. It's at the other end of the hall, Kansas. Okay, so thanks Dr. Bowman for being here. All right, yeah, my pleasure. All right. I have, oh, exactly five o'clock. <laughs> <laughs> wow. All right, well, thank you everybody for having me. Um, so the, the, talk, the, the title of the talk is Combination Therapy for Cancer, Why, When, and How. And, uh, like Jason said, the reason, when I come to give these talks, I don't want to give you some super deep dive into one particular thing. I think everyone here probably has different reasons for being here, possibly different types of cancer you might be dealing with or a family member might be dealing with. So um, I try to keep my talks general and applicable to everyone. Um, and a lot of people receive a uh, combination of chemotherapy, radiation, and surgery for cancer. And so I think I, I like to give this talk to kind of explain why do we combine them and what are the advantages and disadvantages of the three main types of treatment. Um, feel free to stop me anytime and ask questions. Just throw something at me or raise your hand. Um, all right. Okay, so uh, a little bit about me. I'm actually from the West Coast originally. I'm a Niners fan, for those of you following football or in the playoffs. Uh, I went to med school at the University of Illinois Chicago. That's how I ended up in, in uh, the Midwest. And I did my residency there and stayed on faculty. My practice is out at our um, Network Cancer Center affiliated with Silver Cross Hospital, so just down 80. Um, and I've been there for seven, almost seven years now. I treat all types of tumors, so head to toe. Um, unlike some of my colleagues at the main university who specialize in one particular type of tumor, maybe they just do prostate cancer or breast cancer or lung cancer, I treat everything. Um, and like it says there, I'm still a 49ers and A's fan, but it was nice to see the Cubs win. I've actually been here for the Sox and the Cubs World Series. Maybe I brought the good luck to Chicago. Okay. Um, all right, so the goals for today is we'll discuss how and why surgery, chemotherapy, and radiotherapy are combined to treat cancer. Um, I'll give case examples of combination or what we call monotherapy, mono being one. So um, we'll go over some cases of why we might give uh, multiple types of treatment and some case examples of when we would just do one type of treatment. And like I said, just stop me if you have questions or something that you've always been uh, burning to ask a physician. Um, all right, so what are our general treatment options for cancer? And I, I discuss this with almost every patient I see. I, I will sit down after I've done the exam, and the first thing I do is I say there's three basic ways we can treat you. Uh, surgery, chemotherapy, and radiotherapy. Uh, surgery is operation to remove visible tumor. All right, so you usually can't cut out microscopic tumor. Um, so, you know, if you think about, for example, prostate cancer or breast cancer, the surgeon is going to go in and cut out the cancer, uh, but they can't keep cutting things out because eventually you're going to start hitting things that matter. You know, if you have a brain tumor, the surgeon can't just start cutting out a normal brain. That's going to cause problems. Uh, it can also be difficult to operate on many parts of the body. You have to get into wherever the tumor is, and, and sometimes just doing the operation itself can be dangerous or difficult. Um, but it's excellent at getting rid of a tumor that we can see if you can do it safely. Uh, chemotherapy um, is really now not just the traditional chemotherapy that people think of that causes hair loss or nausea or vomiting, but there's new types of chemotherapy. I consider chemotherapy any drug that people take to treat cancer. So it can be injected um, or taken by mouth now. A lot of chemotherapy agents are now um, taken orally. And it usually will go everywhere in the body. Um, because of that, it can cause side effects throughout the body, but it can also uh, treat cancer that's anywhere in the body. So if you think about, again, maybe a patient with breast or prostate cancer, maybe they have microscopic spots of cancer um, in the liver or the lungs or the bones. Chemotherapy can go everywhere and potentially treat those. Um, the downside of chemotherapy is it can't reach areas of the body that don't have a good blood supply. And this is actually important because uh, tumors don't have good blood supplies. They, grow and cause uh, very tortuous, misshapen blood vessels to form. Um, and so oftentimes there's parts of the tumor that aren't getting a good blood supply. And so if you have a big tumor, when I say big, that can even be the size of a pinhead. But to a tumor that's big. Um, there may be parts of it that aren't getting uh, much chemotherapy. 
Um, and so because they might not get enough chemotherapy to kill a uh, larger tumor. Um, and then the last type of treatment option, which is what I do, is radiation or radiotherapy. Um, this, and I'll show you later, but I kind of say it fills in between chemotherapy and surgery. It, it's um, not dependent on blood supply, so it can kill tumors that maybe don't have a good blood supply. Um, but we can also treat normal tissue around the tumor and kill microscopic cancer cells without potentially causing severe damage like you might with surgery. All right? um, now radiation is not as good at surgery in a lot of types of tumors and getting rid of the big tumor we can see. And obviously, not obviously, but um, radiation, if we treat your entire body with it, can be quite toxic. Um, so unlike chemotherapy, it's difficult to treat uh, your entire body with radiation. There are actually ways we do that, sometimes with very low doses um, for um, certain types of blood cancers and other things, but it's, it's not commonly used that way. So let's, let's talk about surgery, the history of surgery. And this is something that's been going on for millennia. Um, there's old I think Egyptian papyrus, uh, or I don't know, papyrus or paintings on walls in pyramids that they found that show, that describe breast cancer and show someone having a mastectomy to remove the breast. Um, does anybody know uh, where, so what surgeons used to be, say, five, six hundred years ago? They, they did two things. They did surgery and they did something else. They were also barbers, so they were called the surgeon barbers. Oh, right. Probably because they, they were the only people in town or in the city that had, that had something sharp. Uh -huh. right? They could shave people or cut their hair and they could do surgery if they needed to. Uh -huh. um, so this is an old, uh, yeah, this is an old painting, um, I think from the 13 or 1400s, I apologize, I don't remember the exact year. Um, but this is a surgeon doing some sort of operation on this patient's head. Um, I'm not sure what the funnel on their head or the book on the woman's head was for. But, Sorry? Right out in the field, too. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, we'll talk about that in a minute. But you can see uh, there wasn't very good antiseptic technique uh, or aseptic technique and not wearing gloves. The patient's not anesthetized. You can see his eyes are open. He kind of has a look like, what are they doing to me? Um, and as we got farther into the 17, 1800s, it still was a pretty gruesome uh, profession because of the lack of anesthesia, a lot of wound infections. Um, I actually remember a story that uh, Florence Nightingale, I remember when I was a little kid reading about this, when they had to amputate a soldier's leg, they would give him a bite, a belt to bite while they did the amputation to keep from screaming. So um, you know, this shows you again kind of a uh, uh, gruesome uh, profession back then. Um, but the things have come along. And, uh, so the barber shop pole that you see, uh, the common one with the red and the blue stripes, is actually because of the surgeon. Um, one thing I read, it's, it's a little unclear where that tradition comes from, but one thing I read was that they used to hang their rags outside on the pole to dry, and so some of them would be bloody and some of them would be clean. And, um, so then we kind of start getting into modern surgery. So in the late 1800s, there were two huge advances um, that helped uh, get us into the modern era of surgery. Um, one was, you can see a big change here. These people are wearing white, presumably sterile gowns. Um, they're still not wearing face masks, uh, but um, a real advance in aseptic technique. So um, clean, you know, the idea of germ theory, uh, being clean, washing your hands, preventing infections. And then the other big advance was anesthesia. Um, so the early things were chloroform or ether, but we've come a long way since then. But the ability to put somebody to sleep, operate on them while they were asleep, and then wake them back up safely uh, opened up a lot of avenues for surgery. Um, so in modern surgery, uh, you can see because of better aseptic technique, better anesthesia, we now use advanced imaging, meaning like CT scans, MRIs, to avoid normal tissues, um, uh, intraoperative monitoring. So uh, I don't know if anybody's heard, they, they can do brain surgeries where they actually do them with the patient awake. And they can monitor different areas of the brain to make sure that they're not hitting their speech center or the part of their brain that controls. I, I've heard examples of piano players where they would have the person move their fingers, and if they hit a spot, the fingers started bouncing, they back up and say, okay, we can't take that up. Um, and then new techniques to help distinguish tumor from normal tissue. So one example in uh, neurosurgery, brain tumors, is using a special dye that they inject, and the tumor will glow bright under a special fluorescent light, so the surgeon can turn the light on and see if there's any tumor left and get a more complete resection, more complete surgical remover, removal. Um, while avoiding normal tissue. So, some pretty amazing technology now in uh, modern day surgery. 
Um, another thing I'm, I imagine many of you have heard about is robotic surgery. Right? So this doesn't mean that uh, um, a robot is operating on you autonomously. Um, this is the surgeon sitting across the room, and actually there's even people piloting uh, using this across thousands of miles. So you could have a surgeon sitting in a, um, say, a naval aircraft carrier operating on a battlefield using one of these robots. Um, most of the time now they're sitting about 10 feet away from the patient. Uh, so you can see, I guess my laser pointer doesn't work with this. Stand up here. So um, you can see the, the scrub team and probably some assistants here. The robot is actually inserted into the patient, and the surgeon is sitting at the control panel here, looking through a three-dimensional um, display and controlling the robotic arms and cutting and everything. Um, and it gives them more degrees of freedom. So the robotic arms can actually move and turn more ways than your hand could. The arms are also much smaller, so they give us smaller areas with smaller incisions. Um, this is reduced. Uh, um, length of hospital stays, reduced blood loss during surgery, um, it's created new, uh, faster healing. Um, I don't know, um, I'm not aware personally of any studies that show this has improved cure rates for cancer because surgeons were pretty good at getting things out in the past. Um, but this certainly has, I think, advanced the, the um, uh, surgical field and, and opened up some areas both to reduce uh, side effects of surgery um, and the ease of recovery for the patient. Um, here's another example of intraoperative monitoring where they um, attach electrodes to the tongue and then can um, track what they're doing in the brain and see if there's any sort of, uh, if they're triggering any sort of reaction in the tongue. Um, how about